So here's what I'm about. <clears throat> my mission. Here's my mission. So, and here's how I realized that this was my mission. So I was um, at our old church that we attended for about 13 years. They had a women's event and I'm sitting at this table with a bunch of other women. And uh, there was a conversation I was having with a woman and she had told me that she had been coming to church for 20 years. Okay. Every single Sunday, 20 years going to church. Okay. And so she was talking about her marriage relationship and pretty much complaining about her husband. And, you know, she had been coming to church by herself for 20 years. And here's what I said to her and the realization of the work that we have to do in the kingdom. Okay. Here's what I said. I said, Hey, do you pray for your husband? And the look she gave me was the one of, wow, never thought about that. I'm like, hold up. I know for a fact that it has been talked about, preached about, especially in these women gatherings about the power of a praying wife. Okay. And then I remember making a phone call to my spiritual mother, talking to her about this. And she's like, oh yes, actually, you know, Michael's writing a book about it. And then I remember praying to the Lord about it, praying to the Lord about it. Like, Lord, what is going on? And here's what he said to me. He said, we as a church, and I'm talking about a church body, ecclesia, we're not equipping people. Okay. So here's a statistic for you. And this is a true st statistic. 53% of people are going to go to hell because believers like myself. Okay. I'm just saying people who go to church every Sunday have the bumper stickers and everything. We just think that all we have to do is invite them to church. And then the church, the church, the church building, the leadership of that church building, it's their job to do the equipping. It's their job to do the rest. All we, oh, did my job, invited him to church. That's the problem. That's not what Jesus said. If you look through the gospels, Jesus didn't say that. And when you get to heaven and meet the father God, he's not going to, hey, did you invite those people to church? No, that's not what he's going to say. He's going to say, what'd you do with the gifts I gave you? And what'd you do? What did you do personally with my son, Jesus? So I'm taking it, uh, ownership and personal responsibility, which I have from the beginning, because I went all in on this Jesus thing, because you know what? Maybe I'm just more broken than most people. Okay. I was like, take it all, take my, take my money. Like that was the first thing. I know that's the last thing for a lot of people take the money take it, take, take it all. And he ripped me of the world and put me into the kingdom. And I knew instinctively, cause I had the Holy spirit inside me that it was my job that I had a role to play here. Okay. So I'm taking ownership and that is what this rise movement is all about has been about. And so what am I going to announce here soon? You're getting some emails right now. If you're on my email list, if you're not on my email list, make sure you go to racheltucker.com. There's a quiz there. That's going to kind of prompt some things inside of you as to whether this new thing I'm doing is for you or not. Okay. Um, and really just have you look a little bit deeper into this. All right. So I'm taking ownership. So um, you'll start to get some more emails of basically what I have rolling out here really, really, really soon. Okay. Um, but listen, but it's, it's really about harvest and there's so many verses and Jesus talked about the kingdom of heaven is like, right? He talked about it being like yeast, where you could take a little bit of yeast and put it into 60 pounds of flour. And what's yeast do? It expands things. And basically everything, it'll push all the darkness out. And what's left is kingdom, right? Then he talked about weeds. And the disciples would say, well, or he told a parable about this. Well, shouldn't, shouldn't we rip the weeds out and not let them grow with everything else. And Jesus is like, no, nope, leave them there and we'll handle it at harvest time. And then the weeds will get burnt. They'll, be, they'll get thrown away and burnt. And then if we look at Hebrews chapter 12, verses 25 through 28, Jesus talks about, or actually the Hebrew writer talks about, um, that's what the kingdom is. Everything evil is going to be shaken and then sifted out. There's a shaking happening. It's been happening. If you have spiritual eyes to see and ears to hear, You've seen this. What's left is kingdom. Okay. 
that's what's left. All right. And so, you know, let me talk a little bit about what we're going to be talking about and about this religious spirit. Okay. So the spirit of religion twist faith. That's what the spirit of religion does. It twists faith. It makes faith human devotion that negates the actual dependence upon the real perceptible person of the Holy Spirit. Yes, friends, the Holy Spirit is a person. Faith isn't contrary to experiencing the Holy Spirit. Okay, so religion is a human effort that takes away his personhood. It takes away the personhood of the Holy Spirit. It actually oppresses believers. Okay. That religious spirit is a self made devotion to a distant, made up God. Okay. Who thirsts for sweat and striving of its followers. This is not the new covenant. The Holy Spirit is our new birth. Right. We have the kingdom of God inside us. That's why Jesus said throughout the gospels, the kingdom is in your midst. It's right here. Hey, B, it's right here. The kingdom is here right now. It's the new, it's the new birth. It's the kingdom of God inside of us, which also with it comes the peace and comes the joy. Joy and peace are not other dependent. They're not dependent upon our circumstance, not dependent upon how our husband is acting. It's not dependent upon, you know, our jobs and our titles and all that. And so listen to this, the antidote to these false religious teachings that emphasize principles over presence is that he lives. Jesus lives. We live through him and by him. Jesus died so that we could have a real experiential communion with him. Okay. Now look, you can give your life to Christ 40 times and not be changed. You know, it's like a dog returns to its vomit, right? Like I've spelt myself backslide a little bit here recently because, you know, I wasn't paying attention, I suppose, you know, maybe drinking a little too much alcohol or whatever. Yes. And Peter tells us be a sober mind because the devil is prowling around looking for people like me to devour who is on track and who has a mission on her life and a call. The devil already tried to kill me, right? And so we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, that evil religious spirit, how maybe some of you have been caught up in that religious, you know, maybe like you're, you, you're all about the religion. Like I'm a Baptist. Okay. Guess what? Baptists don't believe that the gifts of the spirit still operating today. I have a really, I have a story of a, a girl, a friend of mine who sent me in her, her story of how she's been hurt by that religion right? Or maybe it's the Latter-day Saint people that don't think that the Trinity exists, that they're three separate. But if you go read Matthew chapter 28, it says, baptize them in the name, not names, name, one name, one, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, it's one, Trinity. Looks like an egg had three, looks like an egg has three parts, right? It has a shell, it has a yolk, and it has a white, It's but it's just still one egg, right? And look, Jesus told the disciples, I need you to stay here and wait for the Holy Spirit to come. So maybe here's some advice from all those religious people who don't believe that. Maybe go to your prayer room and wait for the Holy Spirit to come. Okay, so awesome. So, hey, hello, everybody coming in on Facebook. We just please share this broadcast as you're popping on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get right to our questions. Okay, and I have a live caller here and I'm going to unmute. And we're going to get right to the questions. Let me see if I could mute. I think you may need to unmute yourself if you want to ask the question live. Okay, so as this person is um, waiting to unmute, I'm gonna go ahead and hit some questions. So here, first of all, I wanna tell you about the story of my friend who went to a Baptist church in this area, right? She had a moral failure, okay, adultery. And basically they made her stand up in church during church service and tell everybody about it. Yeah, they made her stand up in church and tell everybody about it. Then they made her step down from the worship team 
Her job that she worked at was also a church. And the pastor met with her. The pastor leading that church met with her, told her, yeah, you're going to have to step down from your job because she was like, she was head over like the preschool and stuff. Uh huh. Guess what happened to that pastor later on? He had a more affair himself. Yeah, that's what happened, right? But it's almost like when they, uh, in, in scripture, in the gospels, it tells of a story where the Pharisees, the religious leaders, threw this woman out who got caught in the act of adultery and they were like wanting everybody to stone her. And here comes Jesus though. Here comes Jesus. what Jesus say? He asked everybody, okay, all right. He started, he bent down, he started writing in the ground and people are like, what, what is he writing? Right? What is he writing? A person on here, I think I know who it is. Could you just put your question in the chat just in case I can't get you unmuted? Okay. Started writing and he stood up and he said, okay, all right, all you self-righteous people, he does not what he said, but those who were without sin, you go ahead and cast the first stone, right? One by one, people just started dropping their stones and turning around and walking away. And then he looked at the woman like he did, grabbed her by the face. I'm just imagining because this is what happened to me, my experience with Jesus and why I fell head over heels in love. And I'm like, whatever you want me to do, Jesus, I am in 100%. I am not going to fence ride it. I'm all in. And because it kind of knew, because that's how I've always been in my life. I've never been a, a hot, I've never been like a, a lukewarm person. I, whatever I was in, I was all in and on it. In or out. So whether that was sex, drugs, and rock and roll, or whether that was, you want me to serve you, Jesus? And all in. And I started from day one in 2006 learning how to wield my wield my weapon which was my bible study my bible which is one of the things i'm going to equip these women to do as they come into relationship and what i'm going to be rolling out here soon okay so there is one of the stories of religion and how it is not it doesn't hurt or heal okay where's grace in that story where do you see grace there i don't see grace but jesus displayed grace he says who's condemning you she said, nobody. He goes, neither do I condemn you, but listen to what he said. Now go and sin no more. And so at that point, it's really, you know, people ask me all these kinds of questions about that. Like it's about a repentant heart. It's not about a ceremonial thing of going to church every Sunday, checking it off your list. When you give your heart to Jesus, man, and you have that kind of experience, like I did, you ain't got to convince me to do anything. I'm in all in. Maybe it's that daddy love that I never had experienced growing up. And maybe that's what's happened to you because you can't legalize transformation. You cannot legalize transformation. It has to come from the heart. And, and this is where codependency comes into play. Codependency is so insidious that, you know, person in their life may have some codependent and person in their life that's handing them everything their whole life because they don't want them to suffer. They don't want them to get bullied at school because they don't have the best clothes, the best, they don't have money to do this or money to do that. So you have that codependent person in their life that makes sure that they hand them everything and they never have to experience any kind of trial or storm. They never have to land, uh, you know, Les Brown always says, make sure you land on your back, right? They never have to experience any kind of trial to where they have to actually reach up for Jesus. Jesus help me. Nope, because they got some person who's made themselves God in their life that they never have to reach up for Jesus. And they're probably going to church every Sunday, you know, probably even writing a tithe check, but they've never experienced any kind of trial to where they've had to like Jesus help call out to Jesus, right? Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and hit, here's, an, here's one of the questions that I got. And you guys can ask questions here too on Facebook if you want. So I'm, I'm also, those are my podcast listeners, I'm also live on Facebook right now. So here's one now. It says, I got this one by email. It says this, it says so much has changed in the last few months. And I found myself in a place where I'm completely uncomfortable where the universe, and by the way, let me explain the universe. God created the universe. I know the devil wants you to, to reach to all these kinds of different things, you know, reach to this, to re, you got to go here to reach God, this to reach God and the universe. That God created the universe, heavens and the earth. Okay. Anyways, so people don't know what they don't know, friends. Okay. People do not know. Hi, Holly.
don't do that to me, bro. Don't keep some information from me just because you think that I'm, or you know that I have this, you know, wisdom or whatever. And no, please, please don't do that. It says my connection is unstable. Let me turn off some internet stuff here real quick. I'm going to turn my phone on airplane mode. Maybe that'll help. So here it is. When the, where the universe has moved me, for once, I am not for sure at all where it is I need to go up or down, side to side. Okay. There's all these things laying at my feet, wanting me to pick them up. And being a mom, being a wife, and being me are all a battle. Can anybody here relate? Women, period. Can you relate? It ain't easy. <laughs> being a woman. All right. Oh, you know what? Here's one thing I wanted to point out of my friend's story I told you in the beginning. And just like Adam in the beginning, you know, when, when Eve ate the apple, guess what Adam did? Blamed. That woman made me do it. There was no accountability. Any kind of moral failure, the other spouse, you have to take accountability for your part. Why, why would a spouse even go off? Okay, are you... Are you uh, meeting their needs, their love language? Are you loving them on a daily basis? And, and our biggest need is women. Like sometimes, you know, we just need to talk and we don't need your answers or your or your step-by-step -step plan, how do we're going to get out of the way we're feeling. We just need to lay it on you sometimes, right? We need to be honored. We need to be, uh, security is a huge one. And so what's that husband's role? They didn't bring the husband up there with her. Just, just the wife. Okay, sorry. I wanted to say that and I didn't get to say that. Okay, so anyways, so here's where she says, she says, in your message, you talked about pain. In your podcast, you talked about generational curses. And then you talked about bitterness. And I guess as I sit here and talk with you now, a lot, is, a lot of it is bitter. A lot of it is. But how are you supposed to stop all that so that you can move into a better direction? Okay, that's basically her question. When I know most of it is my fault, there's the first thing is accountability, not for setting those boundaries and speaking the truth, but for those who, who are supposed to love and care for you. How can they do those things and have no care at all? Okay, here it is right here, friends. It's accountability. The, my husband and I were talking about this morning when we met is wherever you're focusing, there's energy going there. Okay. So when you're focusing on about how you feel and about this person's not doing that and this person's not doing that, that's where all the energy is going. When the only person you have control of is yourself. And so when you bring everything in, right? So this one isn't really talking about religion, but that's okay. Cause I told people that you don't, it's whatever you want to ask, ask, cause I want to be here to serve you. All right. You can identify it's bitterness. And let me tell you for me, you just got to let that go. You just got to say, Lord, Lord, take it from me. He told me when I was almost dead, he's like, Rachel, resist the devil and he will flee. What's that look like? What's the devil come to do? The devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Are you going to let him? So we're letting him. So we are, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm going to stay here. I'm going to stay here, my bitterness. I'm going to blame everybody else versus bring it in, take ownership of it. Because when you take ownership of it, that's when you have power, right? It's called, um, what's the book that the um, ex-Navy SEAL wrote? It was about owner, about taking ownership. I can't think of the name of the book if somebody on here wants to tell me. Extreme ownership, that's what it is, written by an ex-Navy SEAL. And when you could take extreme ownership, that's when you have power back, okay? You own it. And then you can ask the right questions, okay? And so what you can do is work on yourself. And that's what I did too. I couldn't focus on what other people were doing or not doing because those people of the world, they don't know any better, right? They didn't. And so when you leave the world and you, and you start living in the kingdom realm, because that's what we're in, we're in a realm. That's what Jesus was trying to tell us. We're in a realm. They don't understand how we think. They don't understand how we could overlook stuff and just pray for people. You know, they don't understand all that because they're in a different realm, literally in a different realm. So the only time that we, we got to stop giving our power to people and blaming people, it's life happens for us, doesn't happen to us. Okay. So I hope I answered that question. Okay. So here's another question is this, how do you take spirituality to your next level? 
is there a certain way to pray to be more effective? How do you work through dark times when it's hard to see God? Trusting God through all the times. And that is just it right there. It's she answered her own question there. It's trusting God. So I, I always go back to the story where Jesus, um, the disciples were out in the boat and a storm came and um, Jesus was out here walking on the water. And Peter was the first one out the boat. That was me. I very much can relate to Peter in lots of aspects, just being really brash and being very, yep, I'm in, let's go. You want to fish for men? All right, let's go. Not even really understanding what that meant and what the cost was going to be losing family, losing friends. Like that's the cost of discipleship friends. You know, you, you won't be able to do a lot of miracles where you came from. They're not going to hear you. I'm speaking from personal experience. They're not going to hear you. And it's a very frustrating thing. And then Jesus will finally just remove you. Okay. That's the cost of discipleship, but you know what? It's worth it. I promise you it's worth it, especially when you meet your heavenly father. So an intimate relationship requires some discipline of you. For me, I get up at 5 a.m. I get up, if I don't have to get up at 5 a.m. My kids are self-sufficient. My two youngest kids are juniors in high school. They can get themselves ready for school. I don't have to leave my house to go anywhere other than the gym to go get my own workout on. But I get up at 5 a.m. because I am pulled out of bed with purpose. Nobody has to push me out of bed. I have been building a relationship with Jesus every day of my life since 2006. And I just can't wait to get there. I just can't wait to get there. I cannot wait to sit with Jesus, you know, and just, and just learn and study. I've just, I'm so hungry. I've never lost the hunger since day one to know more, to be more, to do more, to, to give glory to him. Because my story is, you know, when somebody does see me who used to, and there's not a lot of people who have been able to reconcile me from old Rachel to new Rachel. Like there's lots of friends I used to have that I don't really hang out with anymore because through COVID, lots of blind spots revealed that like I would tolerate these things, you know, where we would get together every time and they basically ignore me. You know, everybody go around the table, how's life? What are you doing? Because they all have jobs, you know, like, oh, my, da, da, da. nobody, and then it would, nobody would ever ask me. <laughs> and I realized, man, why am I spending my time here? That's the cost of discipleship, you know? And that's the cool thing about when, when things like scandemics happen, it really opens your eye to really is who is for you and who just tolerates you. I never want to go someplace where I'm tolerated. And that was back home too. You know, not a lot of people are going to be able to reconcile you. Jesus said, Hey, if you, you got to find a worthy home, find a worthy home. And if they receive your message, awesome. If they don't receive your message, let your peace return to you. You don't go someplace that rattles your peace that are trying, you know, they can't take it from you because they didn't give it to you, but you know what I mean? Where you're always in the position of you're always having to, you know, be the person always conforming, be the bigger per, you know, all the dang time. Like that's not your place. You go where you're celebrated. You go where the people mention your name in a room full of opportunities. Like I have a few friends on here right now that do that. Like my friend Holly, who I just met in March. What a blessing. God will take you down past, but a lot of people won't go. I, I say yes to lots of things because just in case, you know, if it's the wrong turn, it's all good. I'm going to meet some really amazing people there anyways. Right. And that's a purpose in everything. See, people are they're, they're just very closed minded, but they're usually the ones with their mouth open all the time. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Let me go right to the next question. So how do you see through the dark times? Let me tell you something is a lot of people don't want to go through dark times, but I'm telling you something. You can't get to the mountaintop unless you go through the wilderness. A lot of people, they want to end their wilderness. They think the wilderness is like a month or a couple months or even a year. My wilderness was seven years, seven years. And, I, and I'm here from hindsight. Everything I tell you, friends, is from hindsight. There's so many things that like from parenting, you know, from like, let me tell you this, you know, like how um, somebody posts, like, what do I do with my kids? I'm on an airplane. They're like, give them snacks. I'm like, is it? And you wonder why people grow up with food addictions. We're wanting to soothe our kids with snacks. Shut them up, feed them, feed them, feed them, feed them. I'm like, give them some Benadryl. <laughs> and I'm here from hindsight, okay? 
I'm not speaking from a judgmental place, but been there, done that, you know, and you wonder why, you know, like I, I did the same stuff, the same stuff. Now I wonder why my 17 year old kid gets a bag of candy and like he steals other people's candy and eats them all. Like, like somebody's going to steal it from him, you know, from hindsight. Okay. So hindsight, what was I talking about? There we go. Here we go. So um, let me just go on to the next question and it'll come back to me because I am recording a podcast at the same time. See, God uses, uses the simple people so he can be glorified. All right. You don't have to have go to seminary or, or have some initials behind your name. A lot of people, they ride and die on all the initials behind their name. They keep, you know, and then, and then they have all this school debt, you know, that they're never going to pay off because that's their identity. It's not your identity, friend. Your identity as a D-O-T-K, daughter of the king. And I'm all right. I have, a, I have a bachelor's degree. I'm feeling all right. Okay, so here's a question that came to me via text, friend of mine. It says, I have faith and I try to explain to my kids all the time. They don't understand how is God so good when he took their dad from them at such a young age. I've explained how he allows trials to build us, to be able to help others but they don't fully see it. Any suggestions? Now here is coming from experience too. And kids are just normally like this anyways. The world revolves around our kids, right? They're, our kids think the world revolves around him and life happens to our kids and they don't understand it as a young kid, right? And life happens for us. And it's this, you. I wanna let you know something. God is a good God. Okay. And, and I remember hearing a story that John Maxwell was talking about. He has an atheist friend and says, well, I can't believe in a God who sends people to hell. Tell me about your God that sends people to hell. I'm like, okay, well, that's a lie because God will go through great lengths so that you don't go to hell, like sending his son to walk the earth you know, to be in ministry for three years of his life, to heal people, to raise the dead, to show you what it's going to be like in the kingdom or what it's like, you know, when you, you know, or has a, have a resurrected body that you actually have to step over Jesus's dead body to get to hell. Yeah. So it's not God that kills, steals and destroys. And I'm not taking away the grieving that comes when you lose somebody like that, okay? But it's the enemy that comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And we're to hold things really loosely here. These aren't ours. They're on loan. Our kids are on loan. Our opportunities are on loan. Our friends are on loan. Our husbands are on loan. Our wives are on loan. We're to hold them loosely. It's when we, when we think we have control and we hold it like this, we don't have control of that. We're all given a certain number of days. Scripture tells us. We're all given a certain number of days. Does he, does he destroy and kill? Yeah. Yeah. So like if somebody like, you know, maybe doesn't uh, listen to that intuitive voice or, or that spirit uh, prompting of head, don't, you know, I had you at this, I have, I have you up behind this slow person for a reason, you know, or you're, you're, you're running late for a reason. And I don't know the actual situation there, but I'm just giving you examples of how, you know, when we go outside the will of God, because you can't stop it. If it's your time, it's your time. There's nothing that will ever stop that. But when, when you can take the tragedy, you know, and, and cause listen, I never would be doing this if it wasn't for my brother's suicide, you know, and other people's responses to that. And this is the worst, this, this is their response. This is the worst thing that's ever happened to me. It didn't happen to you, you know, but that's a worldly perspective when we can understand and we start looking like he takes every single pain that we have and he births something new if we let him. Okay. So being a believer, we're, we come from a place of victory, always living victoriously, even in our trials. It's our attitude during our trials. Are we complaining the whole time? I'm pretty sure I probably complained a lot, right? I'm pretty sure I, I, I complained a lot through my storms. You know, I'm pretty sure I did. So hindsight is 2020. When I can look back, I'm like, man, 
I missed some really sweet times with Jesus during that time. It took me almost dying, like being at peace with dying. Like, man, it's going to be over. Thank the Lord. You know, cause this is <laughs> really, so it's really just realizing that there are over 7,000 promises of God and all of them are yes in him and amen, right? Yes. And amen. And, you know, Holly just reset it. The wilderness is necessary for you to go through. But a lot of people, I was talking to my husband about this, you know, I've had this like uh, heaviness and pain in my back in this area. And, it, and who knows what it's from? It's probably because I were literally carrying like people's, you know, burdens, like give them to me. And then I forget to offload them. And I literally have this, like, I don't know if it's a muscle thing or a bone thing, but I was telling him how a lot of people, like they would probably pop so many Tylenol and, and ibuprofen every, on every single day because they just don't want to feel pain. <laughs> I don't, May, you know, and I know it's my, my pain tolerance was probably really high because when you have a camera shoved up your butt when you're fully awake with a, you know, pineapple sized bloody hemorrhoid, that's the most painful thing ever. And, and my husband's out in the lobby thinking they're sawing my arm off because I have this blood curdling. Like when you go through that kind of pain, like I ain't afraid of pain. <laughs> And my pain tolerance is pretty higher. But other than that, it's like, no, I just hear this. My grace is sufficient. My grace is sufficient. I feel like it keeps me connected to the vine. It keeps me. So my trials and my pains, he wants to use like every single one of them. But a lot of people, they don't want to. It's, ah, I'm good. I'm cool. I'm cool with the mediocre. I'm cool. I don't want to go through none of that. Hey, man, you're going to miss so much. You're going to miss your calling because your calling's on, on the other side of the wilderness and, and you can't go around. Notice like when Jesus, um, okay. So the woman at the well, okay. If you read that story. So the woman at the well, she lived in this town, uh, called Sikar, which literally means like drunkenness. That's what the town of Sikar meant. And most of the religious people, they would travel miles around this town just to avoid those people. Jesus went straight through and met her at the well, at the, at the well, he went straight through that town. And the disciples like, why are we going this way? Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen. That's why the ministry that I have is woman at the well, because man, once I met Jesus, it was game over. The disciples brought back lunch to the well. I, that woman went and told everybody and brought the whole town back. Can I come see? You got to come. That was me. That's still me today. It's, it's not like a, some made up story, you know, like this, my story is really my story, which is why I tell it transparency from a place of victory is an awesome tool friend. Okay. So, um, yeah, so there we uh, any questions over here. So when you go through hardship, you'll realize if you have an internal focus of control or external loss of control, when crap hits the fan, do you hit the fan or do you trust in the Lord, your God, and not lean on your own understanding? And so with that religious spirit, you know, I talked about in the beginning of how it keeps people from Jesus. Okay. Because they don't feel like they're good enough or uh, my sin is too much, you know, trust me, somebody who, uh, you know, started having sex really like 14 years old, started smoking weed was very sexually promiscuous abortions, you know, theft, <laughs> just a misfit, bad person, narcissist, all of it. It's so freeing to be able to say that because I know that somebody's sitting on the other side of this, listening to this podcast, maybe, or watching this broadcast live, or, or maybe Maybe they're going to watch it on replay. And you're thinking, it's for me too? Yeah, Jesus came so that we could have an experiential. He died on the cross so that he could send back the Holy Spirit for us. It's still here, the gifts of the Spirit here. Because if my, if then, then what happened to me, I'm telling you, it, it I'm a lunatic then I guess, I guess I'm, I'm lying to you, but there's a lot of people who saw me sick and then saw me well running a retreat. Yeah. 
the day, the day before my very first retreat, I was dead on my couch. I'm like, I don't even know how this is going to happen. I was in heart failure, lost 20 pounds. Couldn't even really walk. Up. I couldn't even walk up steps. I lost every single ounce of muscle. It's hard for me to even walk because the muscle I'd just been eating, my body just ate it. And I'm like, but the minute that, that whole Bible verse where Paul talks about, it's, it's my power. Jesus's power was made perfect through my weakness for the action of me just getting up and going. Cause I was going, you're going to roll me in a hospital bed. I'm showing up. But the minute I showed up, it left me. I, I, my body went to homeostasis. It was unbelievable. Now, then I overdid it <laughs> and, and I had to go lay down in bed for a little bit, but I had an amazing team on hand that said, we got this, you know, but that's the experience, the Holy spirit and the gifts of the spirit healing, you know, preach, teach, preach and heal, casting out demons, deliverance, you know? And so that is my, you know, mission in life is to get some women equipped, continue to get some women equipped. I did a spiritual equipping workshop back in March where I filled a room at the country club to teach this workshop, to teach women, to get themselves delivered. Okay. So any kind of infirmity that you have or, or, or whatever, because spiritual warfare is really going on. There are really witches and, you know, casting evil spells and Satan worshipers who have been lied to that. This is all we have. Like there isn't an eternity that you have either two choices of heaven or hell. And like hell is a real place. And, and they're, they're, they're being lied to like, this is it. So I'm going to live my life Poof, good now because that's over. It's not because guess what? We do get resurrected and we do get new bodies. We do get a new heaven and a new earth and it's all going to be worth it. The trials are all going to be worth it. That losing the family, all going to be worth it. All of it, losing the friends, all going to be worth it. The persecution, you know, how many emails I've gotten back from people that are my email list. One guy um, yesterday, um, sent me an email and said, shut the F up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so I emailed back. I said, Hey, just unsubscribe. Have a blessed day. He sent back another email that said, who are you? I'm like, well, you're on my email list because, uh, I own the email list. You're part of one of my businesses, you know, probably works at one of our gyms or whatever, or did go to one of our gyms at some point. And just people who are like, you know, they don't want to change. You know why? When sometimes people, I know it's then, then I got one that said, Hey, F you and F your God. Yeah. And it see they're, they're expecting, because this is what worldly people do. They were expecting me to send back, a, you know, shoot back the same kind of uh, reaction that he's sending me. I'm like, nope. No, no. Um, and I was also thinking about this, you know, we have Satan worshipers that live on the corner here and they have their little Satanist flag waving out there. And she's apparently a witch, um, just through people are telling me like, um, and not a good, there are good witches and bad witches, but the good witches, they they're lied to you also like they're whatever, but anyways, and I'm thinking about like, she, they, she has her yard all like just fold up and it looks it's kind of cluttered, but it looks really good. And I'm like, you know what? If I ever get the opportunity and she's outside, I'm going to stop and strike up a conversation with her and be like, this looks really good. You should do now, you know, the Satanist flag, you know, you might, you, you might want to be more just kind of middle of the road. <laughs> just like, that's what John Maxwell does. Like, you know, 90% of his books are, or 80% or I don't know what it is, a very high percentage of his books are sold to this secular crowd because he wants to, you know, you got to be able to value people first. You got to be able to connect with people first before you can really share your faith. He talks about times where, you know, he's like sitting and he's so, you know, he, he really rolls with that wise as a serpent thing, right? Sitting in a room with people and he really prompts them with questions like, you know, what's one question you would want somebody to ask you? So he goes around the table, gets to him. And, and he, so it's his turn to answer the, what's one question you want people to ask you? I, I want people to ask me about Jesus, about my faith. And so there's some people like, you know, all right, tell me. And he's like, you're not ready. 
<laughs> you're not ready, you know? And it's really like, you really got to be able to, what's the saying in business? Like you have to offer, you know, touch a heart before you ask for a hand. And a lot of people miss that whole nurturing process. That's the benefit of investing in coaching, investing in coaching programs, especially, and it's really not even a religious thing. It's not, a, a, it's really about just the nurturing process. People just, they just sell you stuff. They put these posts on Facebook. Here's my stuff, selling it. And they expect everybody to be like, oh, yay. Well, that's not right. But when you invest in yourself, like in a coach or in a coaching program, you know, you teach people. And so this is what I'm equipping women with. I'm equipping, I'm going to teach you how to connect with people and you value everybody. So I'm going to value this girl down here. I'm going to value her. It's going to happen. I'm going to get an opportunity to show her love and, and continue to, to, to nurture that process and to nurture her. And it's not a, oh, there's devil worship. She's, she is a child of God. She just doesn't know it yet. She just doesn't know it yet. She just needs loved into the kingdom, loved into the kingdom. Like Todd White does her such an awesome job at loving people into the kingdom. And that's what we have to do. But see, religion has people thinking they have to strive and be perfect and, and do all, all these things when really you just have to love. You just have to love. But it has to be genuine, right? But see, when you've you know, had a transformation and an experience, you know, I hear from God and I feel so loved all the time, which is why it's probably... You know, I, I think about this with my husband. It's probably really hard to be married to somebody like me, but also very easy to be married to, to, some, to somebody like me for the reason of he doesn't have to like, you know, dote over me to because I, Jesus is, has my heart. I get my acceptance from Jesus. I get my identity from Jesus. I'm loved by Jesus. But then it's also probably hard to be married to me because I am so, I mean, you know, I'm an, eight, seven on the Enneagram. And if you don't know what those are, you know, you should take that test or uh, in gems, you know, Ruby Sapphire. So like, I'm always, I'm very strong and bold and I can see like, you know, eights, um, we could, we could smell stuff. That's bad. Like when the whole scandemic thing, well, I knew right away, this is, this is a freaking scam. <laughs> I smell that right off the bat. Not everybody did, but I did. And that's part of the gift of being that type of personality. So um, at the end of the day, you know, what I mean was it's like, so being married to somebody who's, you know, I could be hard headed at times because I know what I know, what I know. Um, and sometimes I have to um, really work more on the humility part, which I feel like I'm humble in general. Like I don't want pride or ego to be a part of my life because it's so destructive and it really you can't love and have pride at the same time you can't expect people to see things the way you see uh, live your life the way you live your life you know hear things the way you hear things because we all you know have filters on which is one of those communication things that I'm going to be equipping people with women with in this new thing that I'm going to be rolling out so that is the last of the questions that were sent to me. Um, I think I want to just make sure I hit all the questions. Are there any questions over here on Facebook? And I'm still trying to unmute this caller, but I don't think that I can, or unless she can unmute um, and ask. Let me see if I can. Here's maybe I can look it up. Hold on one second, because I'm pretty sure I know who this is. And I'm going to look it up real quick, this question, because I want to make sure that um, I answer it. Okay. Da -da, da -da. Okay. So here, here's the question for the caller that's on. So I'm going to address this question and then we'll wrap this up. My brother died suddenly, December 26, 2021. I believe it was the Johnson and Johnson booster that caused him to seizure and go into cardiac arrest. I told him not to get it, found out after he died, he got the booster two weeks before his death. I live in Florida and my mom is still living in Ohio and it's extremely difficult to deal with. My brother helped me 
with her most of the time. I'm dealing with grief of losing my only sibling and watching my mom grieve and deal with her everyday multiple health issues. I am and always have been inconsistent in following a routine in my personal life, spiritually and physically. I've been asking God for help and believe when I received your email about what I'm going to roll out. If you're on my email list, you know, <laughs> hopefully this will help you know where I am. Okay. So I, the, the thing about it is, is I've been through this already. So when my brother committed suicide in 2013, I was on a trip with my husband in Florida with uh, our team. We, we ran incentives for our old business and people earned the trip. We took them all expense paid to Naples, Florida, to the Naples beach club. And it was the very first day. And see, it caused a lot of rip because they expected me to, to um, run home when my first priority was to my husband and to, you know, I'm hurting also, right? And so that was the place I needed to be. I needed to be around people who were going to support me, love me, pray for me, you know, that sort of thing. And I have my priorities, right? See, when you're in the kingdom, here's our priorities. Jesus, my husband, my children, my church, then my extended family. So they're like down here because when you get married, friends, you, you weave and cleave to your spouse. You leave your home. You leave your home. So your family is like way down on the list, right? Way down on the list. And so the thing about it is it's people pleasing. And you just, as long as you have your priorities straight and in order, you will be blessed. It's when you don't, and you're trying to people please, and you're trying to be this, you can't be all things to all people. You can't. You just have to focus on Jesus and what he wants you to do. And like, guess what? The people of the world aren't going to understand it. So please don't spend your time trying to get them to understand because they're not going to understand it. It's like, it'd be like snow blowing in a, in a, in a blizzard. It's not going to happen. Right. And the past. So Paul tells us in Philippians 3, 13 to look forward. We can't look back. What's done is done. Maybe we made wrong mistakes. Maybe we made wrong turns. People have free will to do. They trust me. There's so many of my family members that died of CA because they didn't want to listen to me. And, and like, but yet they kept going back to the same poison, the same poison three, four, five times and ended up dying. But if they just would have listened, like, how about we try a different way? <laughs> You know, maybe I know something you don't know. You know, I have a friend, actually this friend right here, who, who had it, went the medical way, didn't work. And then her son said, try my way. Guess what? Healed and still healed. <laughs> but anyways, like find a worthy home. This message is for the caller. This is for you. Find a worthy home. And if, they don't receive your message. You have to shake the dust off and keep on moving. As long as you have your priorities straight, you're, you're doing right. Just keep moving forward, shake the dust off and keep on moving and keep on moving. Okay. Well, friends, any, any questions over here before we end this broadcast, make sure if you're not on my mailing list, go to racheltucker.com, take the quiz. You'll be on the email list. You could always unsubscribe if it, if it gets whatever, but maybe you need to, to read them and maybe you need to join. Um, I'm really excited. Um, I've made it just so easy to join. Like you would be insane to not do it. If you're somebody who had, you felt like an ache in your heart, you have a calling on your heart. You know, you want to be part of the harvest and bringing believers and discipling other people, because that's what Jesus told us to do. It's so simple. It wasn't complicated. Read the gospels. Read the gospels. He told us exactly what to do. Teach, preach, and heal. What are we supposed to do? When he met Peter in the boat, he's like, hey, leave this and come follow me. Peter's like, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Jesus is like, change the world. That's what we're going to do. How we're going to, uh, you're going to be fishers of men. Now we're going to catch people. Now, how do we catch people with love? We connect with them. We value them and we nurture that relationship until they're ready to hear your story. This is why everybody has a book inside of them, right? 
Everybody has a business inside of them. Coaching, I'm a coach. We're just disciple makers. That's what we're doing. We're discipling. That's what we do. We engage them. I engage them in my content, right? I have all kinds of content, programs, workshops, live Zooms. I equip them with all those tools from the workshops that they're going to be engaging in. I'm going to teach you how to do deliverance, right? We're going to get really strong and wise and grow in wisdom and stature. And then we're going to empower you with the community, community women that are going to empower you. So get out there, go ye, go ye, cheer you on. As my coach says, rooting for you. Coach Anthony says that to me, rooting for you praying for you. And you need a guide. The Bible tells us to buy wisdom, although it costs you everything you own. I remember one last story before we go. If you go listen to my podcast, Coach Tam is on there. It's the very first one I think I ever uploaded. She talks about a story after she lost millions of dollars, a million dollars in debt. You know, she had the biggest seminar going, get, get motivated seminars. It was the, she had on world leaders, presidents, Super Bowl champions. Keith Kraft used to speak at that conference. Divorce happened, lost it all. Bad, her partner stole money from her, million dollars in debt. And she had this opportunity to go to this coach, to go to this con- conference. It was like $3,000 to go. That's all she had to her name. She, so she could either stay where she's at or go all in. And guess what? She got it back and some Kingdom Builders Academy. I went through it. It's that's why I know a lot of things I know now. I've I've done so much coaching, but that academy that I went through with Coach TM and Coach Zach and Coach Jillian and all Kingdom Builders Academy was one of the best investments I ever made. It was like total investment, about 15 grand uh, being in there a couple of years. Best investment ever made. I got a 300% return on that two weeks. So just be looking for my emails. It, I will also be posting the same on Facebook. Share this with your friends. This is how easy discipling is, friends. If you don't know yet, you just share. Just share it. Invite them in. But be looking out for it. Any questions over here? Be looking out for it. Um, and then we will see you here next time, next Friday, 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Real Talk with Coach Rachel. We'll see you soon, friends.